Thank you. Well, this is the debate Matter and Mind. I'm Joanna Cavenna, and the basic premise of the debate is that neuroscience has enabled us to posit theories about how the brain affects the body, but there's still no prevailing theory to explain how the matter of the brain affects or creates even thought and experience. So the key question within the debate is, is consciousness inexplicable at present because it is not part of the material world? Um, or is it somehow physical and within the grasp of those scientists who are trying to track it and trace it? Um, or indeed, if these notions of the material versus the immaterial or mind versus matter are obsolete and need to be revised. Um, and here to discuss this, we have a very distinguished panel. Um, I shall introduce Marcus first. Marcus Gabriel is a philosopher and author of Transcendental Ontology and also Why the World Does Not Exist. And he's director at the International Centre for Philosophy at Bonn. He's Germany's youngest ever chair in philosophy. Um, and he teaches philosophy in nine languages. Then we have Ray Brassier here. <laughs> yeah. But I don't speak English. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yes, you know, invented languages don't count. But <laughs> Ray Brassier is the philosopher at the American University of Beirut, and he's author of Nihil Unbound. He's also translated works by Alan Badu and Quentin Mayer Sue, and he's one of the pioneers of speculative realism. And I'm sure he'll explain, if you would like, what that is. And Eva Yablonka here at the end is professor of history and philosophy of science at Tel Aviv. She's a theoretical biologist. Her books include Evolution in Four Dimensions, which she wrote with Marianne Lamb, and she's best known for her work in epigenetic inheritance. So the format of the debate is that the speakers have four minutes only to answer a question I shall pose them shortly. Then we'll have a theme debate in three rough parts, and then I'll turn it over to you, the audience. So the opening question, which I'll turn to Marcus first for an answer, is is consciousness inexplicable because it is not part of the material world? Thanks, Marcus. So I think that um, the question how mind fits into nature or how mind relates to matter in the way that we are used to asking it right now is completely ill-posed on, on many different fronts. So let me begin, you know, for saying something about, you know, the book title, Why the World Does Not Exist. What I'm denying is the metaphysical principle of the unity of reality. So for one thing, I believe it's philosophically misguided to believe that there's one big entity or domain, the world, and that we have to fit everything into that domain, which would be defined, for instance, as the absolute totality of everything everything which exists. And then you could start debating about, you know, what really exists, does mind really exist, does, does matter really exist, etc. If that's the way of approaching the topic, then you're already misguided because you make way too many metaphysical assumptions that I think are ultimately untenable. So first of all, I think we have to overcome metaphysics and therefore also questions such as, you know, should we be dualist, that is, should we believe that there are two kinds of substances? Should we be monist, that is, believe that there's just one substance? Should we be pluralist, that is, believe uh, that there are whatever, many substances, okay? So I think the early modern debates that are still with us uh, and that have posed the problem of consciousness the way that we're still discussing it, I think those debates are as misguided as early modern physics. So uh, all of this is misguided. We need a new framework in order to ask the question. Nevertheless, there are versions of the question uh, that are with us that are tenable, but you have to rephrase the premises of the b debate or so, I believe. So let's look, for instance, at, the, at notions like mind and consciousness and self-consciousness, etc. What's remarkable if you come from a different, you know, like non-English speaking community, such as a German speaking community, is how surprising it is, you know, like we have no German word for what in English is called mind. You cannot translate mind into English as much as you cannot translate the German word geist into English, okay? They are not exact synonyms. So I, I, I have a hard time even understanding what people mean <laughs> when they ask, you know, mind and matter. You know, mind for me is like schmeint, you know, so you have to give me, you have to give it <laughs> meaning. And when I look at, you know, the meaning that people are trying to give it, you know, then philosophers at least will tell you something like, you know, if you want to know what mind is, you got to find the mark of the mental. What's the mark of the mental? Well, the mark of the mental is what makes something mental instead of non-mental. Well, that's of course not very helpful 
helpful because mental is just Latin for mind, so that doesn't really get us anywhere. Um, so what they then say, and that is, is still the most hopeful way of even making sense of the question, I think, is they say something like, yeah, forget about mind, let's talk about consciousness. And then things get uh, really tricky because I think that consciousness might also mean all sorts of things. Some things that we call consciousness, I think, are of course biological phenomena, such as being awake, you know. The fact that I'm awa awake right now and not, you know, so drunk that I can't even engage in a debate. Well, those facts, I'm not on LSD, I'm, uh, for all I know, uh, you know, like those facts um, are biological, obviously. So there's no, I don't think there's a mind matter problem there. First of all, we can explain them, etc. So I don't believe that there's what people have called the heart problem. I don't think that there, you know, you can look at my brain and then it looks stupid and just pink. And uh, but from within, you know, I'm awake. So how do they s they relate to each other? Well, here's how they relate to each other. You know, if your brain is a certain state in a certain state, then you are awake. So that that that's I think is not a problem. But there are problems with consciousness, such as you know, like how can I ever be in a truth app state? I think that's an interesting question. So how can brains have access to truth app states, even though brains, you know? do not seem particularly suited to, you know, due to their evolutionary origin, etc., to grasping, you know, as it were, pure truth, such as 2 plus 2 equals 4, etc. So uh, how is it possible that uh, brains, you know, uh, realize states that make it possible for us to significantly go beyond uh, anything that takes place within our heads? So, t you know, to, to throw out another credo, you know, the external is credo, but a little bit more generalized, I think that, you know, parts of consciousness just ain't in the head. So if you're looking for consciousness, you know, within your skull, then you will find some elements of what we legitimately call consciousness, and they are not mysterious. But you will also find, you know, other features that we ascribe to consciousness, such as, you know, those features that put us in contact with something outside our skull. So for me, the real interesting question is, uh, how is it possible for, you know, uh, organisms to uh, uh, grasp uh, propositions. I think that's an interesting question that comes with all sorts of riddles, but the riddles are quite different from those that, uh, you know, the metaphysical framework is allowed uh, to pose within which we are currently operating. I think that framework is profoundly confused. Well, my answer to the question would be straightforwardly no. Um, and I think that there's um, the terms, I also I agree with much of what Mark has said, that the, the question is badly posed or badly framed. There's a, there's a fundamental confusion uh, which underlies the premises uh, uh, of the question. I think the fundamental distinction uh, to get going on this problem is to is between, to understand the difference between knowing what we mean when we use the word consciousness and knowing what consciousness is. There's a fundamental difference between knowing what something means and knowing what something is. We knew, human beings knew what water meant long before they understood what water truly is, its microphysical structure. The presumption that we are better acquainted with our own minds than anything else, which is for instance, the, the fundamental Cartesian assumption is, I think, you know, predicated on this confusion. Uh, there's this assumption that we are directly acquainted with the constitutive properties of our own mental states or conscious experiences, uh, and that this somehow, um, this our familiarity with our own minds means that uh, we're in a position to say what they are and what distinguishes them from other, any other natural phenomenon. Um, the arguments, there's been a revival of dualism in recent Anglo-American philosophy. Um, the arguments for dualism, such as the famous explanatory gap argument, as formulated by David Chalmers in 1996 in The Conscious Mind, it seems to me that they all proceed from the, uh, the assumption in terms of this conflation between knowing what something means and knowing what something is. Chalmers begins with the, the premise that we are directly acquainted with the so-called phenomenal properties of our conscious states, and then concludes that these properties, um, which are intrinsic qualities of our experience, are fundamentally different in kind from the types of properties catalogued by physical science. That is, physical science can tell us about the functional 
or relational properties of, of entities, but never about their intrinsic or non-relational features. <laughs>